uh, once again, good morning to everyone. Thank you so much for once again joining our local government conversations, uh, an initiative of Future Cities Africa and the Municipal Edge. And my name is Dr. Emmanuel Ngobo, representing the Municipal Edge and uh, the Future Cities Africa, represented by uh, Dan Klassen from the Future Cities Africa. But also um, on my side, I'm a public servant in local government. And I was just um, looking back that it's almost now 20 years that one has been at local government and one has come, in, come a long way. But uh, obviously there is a long way to go as we seek to bring about an improvement in our local government. And basically on my side, truly I wouldn't work anywhere else but for local government. Much is needed to be done and we need all the hands to be on the deck, you know, so to say, so that we can sort out the challenges that are facing our municipalities. And hence, we have started to embark on these conversations so that we can blend the theory with practice and critically find ways of uh, working close with universities for these much needed solutions in this space. So these sessions um, mainly are for the university students um, but we also further appreciate other stakeholders that have been joining us along the way, uh, municipal officials that have been part of these sessions and also contributing. We truly appreciate your time that you've actually taken to be part of this. And we hope to build on this going forward and include more other stakeholders as we actually proceed. But as we have started, we don't do too much at one go, but it's something that we'll build upon. And as um, everyone possibly is aware that we do share these recordings to the universities. Um, mainly Stellenbosch will then be passing on as they've started to join DUT and TUT and also UCT has also expressed interest for us to actually share these with them and we can start to include them as well going forward. So on that note, I just want to bring upon um, the short introduction as I've done though, but just in a presentation format. All right, so we are here now dealing with um, innovation in smart cities. And then next year we'll be dealing with the issues of personal leadership. Uh, the session for today, just in brief, it may not exactly take this shape, but we aim to ensure that as we start, we shall be finished by 12 p.m and we'll ensure that all that um, we are takeaways for today, we obtain as much as possible in terms of the input and the content that we seek to derive. Our speakers for today, we've got uh, Dr. Ruenda Luot, uh, the lecturer at uh, the School of Public Leadership, University, Stellenbosch University, dealing with issues of sustainable development. Uh, Ms. Tendo Mafame, PhD candidate for urban and regional planning, also uh, at Stellenbosch University, but I'm trusting that Dr. Ruenda will explain in more detail with regards to that. And then we've got uh, Mr. Philip De Brain. Uh, we have had him before, the Managing Director of Business Engineering. Thank you so much, sir, once again for your time and that you actually give unto us and the contributions that you make and passing on the knowledge over the years that you have actually attained in local government. And then lastly, we've got Mr. Daniel Nolte, an outstanding panel member, the head of capacitation and development for the Center of Municipal Asset Management. So with that being said, let me now then hand over to Dr. Ruenda Lutz, who will then take us through the presentation on innovation for smart cities um, who will also be uh, co-presenting with Ms. Tendo Mahfame. Over to you, Dr. Rwanda. Um, good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us. Um, it really is an honor to be included in this forum. Um, so my name is Rwanda, and with me um, online is Tendo. Tendo, do you want to switch your video on and just give us a wave? Today, we are going to talk about... Um, smart cities, but really from a standpoint of just sustainable futures. And um, maybe if I can steal one extra minute to say that my journey to here has been very, very strange. Um, I thought I was going to study psychology. Then I 
went to university and I found science. So I did three years of psychology and um, natural sciences. I hated biochemistry when I was studying it. Then in my third year, I fell in love with it. Then I did 12 more years of biochemistry. And now I teach sustainable development. And I think the, the reason I want to preface um, what I'm sharing with you today with that is I am, I'm just incredibly passionate about design and how we might do things better. So I hope that some of the ideas we share today will inspire you. Um, when it comes to local government, I'm certainly not an expert, but I love having conversations with people. And I think that a platform like this, where we get to share ideas, expertise, and we get to dream together is absolutely the first step in the right direction for designing cities that serve people better. Um, so I am the program lead for the Diploma and Advanced Diploma in Sustainable Development at Stellenbosch University. Um, it's a very unique program, and I love to think that we are also working with future leaders. Um, and it's, a, it's an amazing program, and Tendo um, also teaches as part of our faculty. Tendo, would you like to just color in your, your background for us? Uh, yes, uh, so as Rwenda has said, so actually um, most of the time when I choose a PhD candidate as my primary uh, credentials, it's because I'm trying to put myself out there and also marketing myself for future opportunities because if I say I work, then I don't get anything. So uh, as Rwenda say, uh, my name is Shendo and also I'm a PhD candidate in urban and regional planning. But with this also, I have been uh, co-facilitating the Diploma in Sustainable Development with Rwanda since 2020. So I teach the models of sustainable cities and also uh, sustainable monitoring and evaluation. So this is also coming with some of my work experience in community-based organization and a little bit of local government. So I am one person who is more familiar with the local government policies and I'm actually quite excited that will be co-presenting this session with Salga. Thanks, Rwenda. Thank you so much, Tendo. Okay. So, like I said, we'll talk a little bit about what makes a city smart, but for both for Tendo and myself, the, the real focus here is the potential of a smart city to create just and sustainable futures using digital technologies. And we also really wanna think about what that looks like for Africa and South Africa specifically. So yeah, it's, it's really is an honor to, to share some ideas with future city leaders and decision makers. Uh, so as I mentioned, I really approach sustainability from a design perspective. And I'm very excited about cities specifically of their, because of their potential. They only cover 2% of the Earth's surface, but more than half of the world's population live in cities. And we know with uh, projections that that number is just going to increase. So half of the world concentrated in 2% of the Earth's surface, um, but within those city boundaries, we consume about three quarters of the world's material resources. So if we get city living right, uh, the gains in terms of environmental benefits and social impact will be enormous. And I think that's why it's worth investing in our cities. So I'm gonna start with a imagination exercise. If you, if you will join me on a day in my life in Cape Town, which is where I'm based. And I'm gonna take you through a day in the life of Rwanda in 2023. So as I step outside in the morning, my phone automatically tells me how long my commute will be today. And today the fastest route to work is to hop on the electric bus that is about two blocks and five minutes away from me. On this electric bus, we take the fastest route with smart technologies telling the bus that today the fastest route is to zip through the regenerated part of the CBD. And it's really a beautiful space to drive through because all these old buildings have been given a new lease on life. 
So they're now these vibrant, multi multifunctional, multi-purpose centers where people can live and work and shop and exercise and hang out in, in a small space or close proximity. And we're, as we're driving, we go past the grocery shop that automatically tells me, hey, we have a two for one wine special today. And I can very easily place my order to be delivered to my flat by the time I get home. It's also really great as we're driving, and I think about how crazy it was that just eight years ago, we had load shedding all the time. And now we're in a city that's almost powered completely by solar. And as we're driving, I think about the fact that no energy is wasted in the buildings that we're passing because there are smart systems that regulate the temperature inside the buildings and sensors that know to switch off the lights um, and any energy intensive appliances when people leave the room. Yeah, and it's just weird to think about what we used to be doing in 2022. It's a really nice drive because technology synchronizes all the traffic lights, so it's green as we go, and that cuts down the travel time significantly. And then the Wi-Fi on the bus is stable, fast, and free. So I'm very happy to take public transport. I can get quite a lot of work done on my way to the office. So I love coffee. I don't foresee that changing <laughs> anytime in the future. And my coffee shop that's about that's just outside my office building knows when I'm five minutes away and asks me if I want to place my regular order in advance, obviously in a biodegradable cup. And as I get off the bus, I don't have to dig in my purse and find a card. My fare is automatically deducted and my coffee is ready and waiting for me as I approach my office building. And getting into the building is very easy because there's facial recognition so I can walk straight in. And I also feel very safe because there's technology that scans everyone who enters the building for dangerous items. My company took a lot of lessons from the pandemic. So we have um, flexible working hours and we also have a flexible work from home, work from the office uh, policy. So yesterday I pre-booked a workstation uh, using an app and I decided I would like a desk with an ocean view today. And when I sit down and I log into the desktop, all my personalized desktop preferences and my IP settings are already uh, pre-populated on this desktop. I like being efficient with my time. So I use my lunch time to do a telehealth checkup with my doctor. I don't have to leave my desk and he can monitor my vital signs in real time. And those are transmitted via our smartphones. And of course I get a clean bill of health because my commute to work is so stress-free that I'm just doing really well. I don't feel like taking the bus back to home and I decide I feel like a cycle down the promenade. Uh, I use a bike app to quickly check out one of these bicycles outside my office and I cycle back to home where I can just check in the bike from at the nearest bike station. Easy peasy. Uh, my two for one wine special is waiting for me in the foyer. So I pick that up. I sit down, I unwind drinking a crisp Chardonnay, looking over the lights of this smart city. And I think, wow, life is good. It sounds a bit utopian, right? Um, at, and at the moment, especially this week, I just wanna live in a city that's free of load shedding by 2015. That's, that is enough smart for me. Um, and I think there's always this danger when we talk about smart cities and innovation that it becomes incredibly futuristic. And today when we're talking about what a smart city means and specifically what it means for South Africa, I don't want us to get lost in this happy, happy, I'm never going to stand in a queue for a coffee ever again. Uh, all of those things are obviously possible with the technology. Um, it's It's ready and waiting to be used, but that's not the true potential of a, a smart city. The real value of all of these technological and digital innovations in cities is to make our cities more livable. And 
when I think about what that means, it means cutting down on some of the things that really take away from our quality of life. If you live in Cape Town, you know what it's like to sit in the traffic. Uh, it's it, it's time waste. It's dangerous. It, uh, it doesn't add. It doesn't spark joy. And part of all of those things is that it has an enormous negative environmental impact. So when we think about smart cities today, we really want to think about how do we make them healthier spaces for the environment and for people, and how we use cities to create equal and equitable living opportunities. And I think for a long time, when we were presented with this idea of smart cities and smart technologies, it was positioned as these technologies that would be tools for city leaders that would allow you to work behind the scenes to manage the city more efficiently and the city systems more efficiently. But really, the way that it plays out is that the keys to the smart city have been placed directly in the hands of the citizens. And it's, it's good and right that that's how it is. So we want to think today about the technologies, but more specifically what that looks like and how we think about working with the people who live in the cities to create smart cities. So I'm going to hand over now to Tendor and she's going to um, take us through how we might design smart cities from a local government perspective. And we'll also spend a little bit of time towards the end of the presentation, just looking at some of the really easy, low tech uh, technology, not technologies, but low tech ways that we can actually make this happen. Tendor, over to you. I'm going to mute myself, but um, please just let me know if I forget to change your slide. Okay, uh, thank you, Rwenda. Um, thank you so much. So of course we can all hear that uh, from what Rwanda have been saying, you know, it's, it feels like a dream. That's the city that we all want to live in. We all want to live in the city, what, that's hassle free. But also when we are looking at our context as South African, you know, we should look at this notion that a smart city is that one which increases the pace of improving social, economic and environmental sustainability outcomes. And how it does this, it's that it does this by actually responding to some challenges such as climate change, rapid population growth, some of the political and economic instabilities. So how you can actually try to apply this is that you can try to apply this by actually having active engagement with the society and also how you can have some of the collaborative leadership methods. So when you look into the collaborative leadership methods, we know that it's not something that is easy. You know, you have to work across disciplines and city system. You have to make use of data, information, and also some of the modern technology in order to provide some of the better quality services. And also, you know, you want to make that city the place where people choose to live in. So with this uh, coming with the inspiration from the South African Smart Cities Framework, we are very fortunate that in South Africa, we have such a framework in place, is that a smart city should actually have things like smart mobility, smart living, smart people, smart environment, economy, and governance. So the core that I wanted to emphasize on, it's more the smart people. Smart people, we're not talking about the one who get number one at school, but it's more like when you are smart people, it's more like what kind of education are we having? What kind of a society are we living in? You know, do we have easy connectivity so that we are able to have like smart mobility? Do we have, smart living, the by smart living, yes, we all love glass building and elevators that move fast, but smart living more like we really want a safe, culturally diverse and vibrant society. So all this actually also trying to also contribute into our health. So that's why this actually means that, you know, a smart city initiative should ultimately benefit all the people and all communities in the city while also trying to improve their well-being. So moving on to the second factor. So in South Africa, again, it's like the existing uh, smart cities framework, it's already still aligned with the national development uh, plan identified factors. So with this is that, of course, we aim that our smart cities should try to create inclusive society that is sustainable, resilient, and also safe. So that's why with this, you look at that, you know, smart city should 
link various points of conventional operations and service and services that are also provided by the municipality. So since we are still at the beginning when we are thinking of a South African context is that the smart cities initiative can start to get tested at smaller things like the waste management system, the water treatment, sewage management, things like licensing, primary health care, disaster management, community safety, metropolis and social development services. So this actually makes the smart city that we are creating in South Africa to actually have some of the relatable experiences. Uh, moving on, Renda. So of course, uh, with the uh, relatable experiences, our suggestion is that, you know, a smart city program, it needs to be fully integrated into the IDPs. Why, when a smart city becomes one with the IDP, it allows for testing of ideas. So with this, you, you reduce the cost of maybe trying to think a smart city as some of the larger mega city that's gonna be rebuilt from the ground up some way. You also try to create, when you're working within the IDP space, since IDP also have the platforms of uh, community engagement, you try to create some of the knowledge sharing platform. By this also, you not only improve efficiency and productivity, but it will help also the local government with making informed decision, you know, what to do and what not to do. And with this, you're trying to have misaligned uh, developments or misaligned implementation, because if we are thinking of a smart city as some big city that people are all gonna move in and it's all high tech, you know, is that what actually the people want? Or we can start testing some of these ideas from the communities and also with the IDP having this platform. So with this, we think that it will actually help us to have some of these holistic approaches that we actually require to make uh, South African smart cities. So drawing on some of this, of course, is that when a smart city, it's, it should be a societal ambition, not just from the top-down strategy, you know, all citizens and communities, they should be involved. And also that's why it will make it citizen centric. With this, it will be reflecting on the desires of the citizen and actually addressing the needs of the community. So I think we have moved also into a South Africa where we understand that now people are pushing that mental health should be primary health, like a person should be able to walk into the clinic and be able to receive some form of counseling. So you can see that this is what, the, the listening to the student actually guides on what to do and what not to do and actually what is important to the people. Uh, moving on, uh, actually, it's that, you know, of course, when we are looking into smart cities, you know, we are just, we are not an island as South Africa. We also have to look at some of the world's best practices and also what other countries have done. And I chose two of the case study and the first one is Barcelona in Spain and the second one is Nairobi. So what Barcelona have done is that they aim at adopting new technology to make city more energy efficient, They to create like, Thorough connectivity, data rich, and also some of the sus sustainable in some of the sustainable terms in terms of mobility. So they did this by also trying to extend their smart city concept at national level to undertake the various programs that integrate and coordinate multi-region initiatives and also supporting some of the businesses and all ongoing smart initiative territory. And the other takeaway for me while I was spending my time in Barcelona was this GenCat. Uh, language app. So as part of the smart city, this is just like one of the examples that show a smart city is not about, it's not all about high tech, we're going to be driving electric cars, but it's also something as small as language exchange app. And I thought in our country where we have 11 languages, how wonderful will it be that when you are somewhere in a different province, you are still able to communicate because you will have a language exchange app that will tell you the phrase in your language and you can be able to translate to the other person. That is not trying to discard English as a language, but we also have other languages because you'll find that in Barcelona, they use this language app to actually promote their local language of Catalan. So you will have the translation between Catalan and English and you can learn the few greeting words. And also, so, you know, I thought like apps like this, what we can learn, or even if it's not an app, even if it's just a small booklet in a South African context, it will allow actually the visitors to communicate with the locals at, me, at ease. And something that we all are here, we are not able to greet each other with our languages. So if we have somewhere where it's documented, where you can quickly learn a phrase, 
I feel that this is something that South Africa can learn on when we're thinking of our smart city development. The second case study that I chose was uh, Nairobi. Uh, we all know that you know Nairobi, it, it has been ranked as one of the most dynamic, fastest growing cities in the world. So of course, Nairobi have managed to customize their smart city innovation according to the local needs. For instance, if we can all think back between 2006 and 2007, the launch of the Mbesa mobile app, the one that uh, people could uh, send money without having a bank account. That was actually some of Nairobi smart city initiative that suited the local needs. It's trying to get people from sending money through the envelope, through the post office, but how about you have the local creation like Mbesa that people can be able to exchange the money in a safer way and more secured way. So the other additional things in Nairobi, also the creation of the technological innovation hub in the Kibera Township. We all know Kibera is the most popular township also we can say it's one of the popular townships in, in, in Africa. So some of the well-known Kibera examples, you'll find that examples like the water and sanitation problems and how they've solved them from the bottom up, how communities came together and tried to solve their sanitation problem. So that's why I say it's something as small as these kind of initiatives that us also as South Africa, we can also learn that as much as city initiative, it should be something that is relatable and also it tries to solve the local context. So moving on also uh, drawing inspiration from the South African Smart Cities framework. We all know that uh, of course, uh, South Africa, we want the smart city that it should be the smart city for all. Being smart city for all is that it have to incorporate smart technology and initiatives that will collectively contribute to the well-being of everyone. So that is making sure that all sectors actually benefit from the formal and informal sectors. And also one, one sector that I am quite passionate about and I've also written a lot about is this township economy sector that most of the time township economies is treated as if it's not part of the larger economic sector. So when we are thinking of our smart city, I would love to see our smart city in South Africa, including township economies and also prioritizing it. So of course, that's not trying to not prioritize things like technology, the larger commercial spaces, administration, things like health, education, and also various uh, lifestyle activities. But with this, we also see that, you know, we have to try to create a smart city for those also who are not digitally literate, the disabled, the marginalized citizen, and also the people with no assets. Sometimes some of these smart city things, they feel like it's for somebody who already have nicer assets or they're already living in a smart apartment. You know, it's for somebody who already have a car. So when we are thinking of our smart city, it should be a smart city for all, meaning everyone who is who is part of the city should actually be included, including the people who are not digitally literate. How do you make them part of the larger uh, smart city system? Second is that uh, our smart city should actually use technology as a enabling factor and not as a forcing factor. It's because, you know, according to the Smart Cities Council, a smart city is not smart because it uses technology. A smart city is smart because it uses technology to make its citizens' life better. So that's why with this, you look into identifying opportunity and trying also to incorporate some of the technology factor. Of course, the use of technology should not marginalize the vulnerable groups of the society. And also it should try to mitigate towards the divide. We all know that sometimes when you're thinking of this high tech thing, it can work towards dividing the society further and further because if I need an app to be able to order a car or to order a lift, how about somebody who doesn't have a phone? So you try to perpetuate that uh, digital divide that will make the society get divided further and further. However, we cannot ignore the fact of the importance of the fourth industrial revolution, uh, things like 5G, that we are living in the technological world. And also when we're living in the technological world, we, we still have to adapt and catch up with what other countries are doing. And that's why for me, I thought, we should maybe also respect the fact that when we are moving forward into the smart cities, there are gonna be smart families and the smart families will be these little robots that we have a picture here, that maybe we should respect that when we are meeting the smart family, which is a mom and a dad and a child for the robot, we should respect them and not say a robot cannot log in or a robot cannot enter into this space because this is the world that we are moving on. Um, the third factor, 
I think that, you know, a smart city, of course, it should be shaped by the local context. So when you think of the conceptualization of smart city, it should vary, of course, from city to city, though we are still within South Africa, and it should vary from country to country. But all this, of course, it will depend on the level of development, willingness to change and reforms, resources, and aspirations from the cities. So we have seen it that, you know, popular images of smart cities from around the world, they are often high tech visions, very clean, very orderly. And mostly they do not resemble the life conditions that we as South Africans can actually relate to. And I always think that, you know, local conditions need to be carefully considered to ensure that appropriate technologies and initiatives are implemented. And I give an example of the Freedom Park in Gauteng that when you look at the Freedom Park building, I see would this building as part of the smart city initiative because why this building have been uniquely designed and it's it it's been designed on a way that when we look at it it's it's not orderly it's not straight line it's 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 underground but also it's still above ground when we think of our popular rendezvous how do we make our city that still resemble those things this is also thinking of that we have some of the core south african issues poverty, inequality, unemployment. So we should be thinking that, you know, our smart city should be solving this. So when you think of that, you know, if we are gonna have a smart city in South Africa, you also have to have some of the additional structural challenges, you know, such as the importance of informalities and municipal capacities, because informality is part of us. I don't know why we still call it informality. It should just be called, you know, it's part, it's part of our cities. It's how the cities are. Why should we still have that divide between the formal and informal? The fourth factor, of course, is that our smart city needs to respond to the local needs. And by responding into the local needs is that we need to have those active community participation and not consultation. So when you create some of the working groups through workshops, you know, the local youth empowerment groups, this all allows for the identification and development and implementation of actually what is needed and what is required, what is aligned with the local need. I always think like, you know, in my head that if we are thinking of a smart city in South Africa where we will be walking out and there's screens all over showing us temperatures, showing us direction of where to go, this is a South Africa full of opportunities. Someone is gonna see those screens and see them all. Oh, here yeah, I am, I got the stock of my TVs, I'm gonna remove each one of these screens and go sell them. So that's why it's like, you cannot think beyond things that are not suiting or aligned with the local needs because if you are in, in putting screens all over and speakers in a country where there's unemployment, people don't have TVs at home. Of course, people are gonna see those screens as part of the free material that have been provided for them. So that's why the participants of your Smart Cities Initiative should include the residents, the business communities, universities, research organization, government departments and industry, because together when all these departments are together, they're able to come up with solutions that actually solve some of the pressing community issues. And then uh, the number five point for me is that, you know, a smart city should actually embrace innovation, partnership and collaboration. I mean, initiatives and actions that originate from both public and private sector and the citizens themselves, this will allow also that they are actually solving their holistic needs. And when you think of innovation and partnerships, I have uh, had an opportunity to work with some of the partnerships and you can see that partnerships or partnering organizations, they're actually quite helpful when it comes to testing some of the ideas before they become per, uh, um, permanent solution. So how I also see the partnership organization working with this collaboration is that partnership organization can actually be a direct contact point of citizens. So it's like when a citizen have an innovative idea or when a community have an innovative idea, where do they take this idea to that could be tested and also maybe scaled up to something or to be tested and then we realize it actually doesn't work. So this is why innovation and partnership and collaboration are important. Moving on, of course, uh, our smart city, you know, it should be sustainable, resilient and safe. And this is aligned with the complements of the Sustainable Development Goal 11, which calls for cities to be inclusive, safe, resilient and sustainable. 
But by this also, you want like a multifaceted integrated approach, thereby using technology to create a more resilient city and also enhancing the city's ability to deal with some of the chronic stresses and shocks. In South Africa, I would say I would love for us to, you know, maybe starting also to use some of our smart technology to create safer communities because we all just want to be safe. And you know, the creation of safe communities, it's linked to social cohesion. When you don't have that safe community, you can't have social cohesion. And this is also referred to in the National Development Plan and also the White Paper of Safety and Security. And some of the additional UN publication that, you know, when we think of our smart city, I would think in South Africa, the safety will be most important. And then with safety comes inclusivity and then resilience. So uh, as we move on from these uh, points is that, you know, when you think again of South African readiness for smart city, of course, this is a question that will come up time and time again is that, you know, is South Africa ready for smart city? But also this comes with a thorough understanding of the nature and purpose of a proposed smart city. So this is crucial to fully comprehend the role and impact of a particular initiative of a citywide. Why? Because the likelihood of a smart city initiative to succeed, it depends on the alignment with the existing plan and initiatives of which we are recommending this initiative should be from the municipal or local government level. So a smart city initiative also should actually enhance learning from peers, we are learning from other municipality, we're learning from other city. So that's why you require this level of cooperation between the municipality, role players, and also some of the policy maker. And then when you look into people's knowledge, skills, competencies, experiences, qualification, attitude, and also maybe we thought, you know, the possibility of reskilling and training programs that might actually require when implementing a smart city initiative that maybe sometimes we need to sit back and look into ourselves, relearning what is important for us, what can make change for us, and then maybe not necessarily like getting uh, carried away with all high tech stuff and flying cars that, you know, this is gonna be part of a smart city. But when we actually reskill ourselves and go from the bottom up, go to the ground roots, go to where actually we come from, how, where do we come from as a country and actually where are we going? So this comes with some of these uh, core enabling factors. These core enabling factors, they are actually according to the South African Smart Cities Framework. The South African Smart Cities Framework suggests that, you know, we should have a smart cities plan, which for me, I feel that in South Africa, we already have enough plans. So we do not necessarily need a new smart cities plan, but we could use what we have and try to improve from there. Digital infrastructure is important. Skilled people, yes, maybe this is what we call it, but I would prefer calling it maybe reskilling because skilled people are already available. The importance of partnership, the importance of uh, community involvement, and also the importance of creating some of the transformational cities. So Rwanda will take uh, over from here and tell you more about how we can actually create some of these transformational cities. Rwanda? Thanks so much, Tito. That was so good. I could listen to you all day. <laughs> So I'm going to try and pull together some of the, the points that Tendo made, um, reiterate some of them because they're really important, but then also think about, so then what? Um, how do we actually do this in a practical sense? And again, um, because I, I really, in my teaching and my way of thinking, I'm very focused about the practical and the design of these things, I want to show you a couple of examples and tools. So when we think about smart cities in South Africa, like Tendo mentioned, we really want to think about the transformation of our city spaces. So it's not about the flying cars, but it's about the transformation of our existing policies into practice. It's the transformation of our spaces and our communities. And um, yeah, it's, it's not about more, more documents and more policies. We really want to think about um, how do we use our existing resources wisely. And I think this image that Deloitte created in their report is very useful in terms of capturing all the different aspects um, that we need to consider when we think about the dimensions of a smart city. And I think one of the most important parts and sometimes overlooked, but this is why we're here today, is the importance of governance and leadership. 
And I think from, from this image, you can also imagine that governance and leadership is the core pillar on which our smart cities will be built. So um, the report from Deloitte also points out that we need strategic leadership because it underpins all of the different dimensions of the smart city. We need a strong political mandate with champions that are committed to enhancing service delivery. And then together with that, we need an unambiguous plan and vision for how we want to use smart technology within various government departments. So this vision is only useful if it actually translates into tangible practices. And this vision needs to guide how we think about our city systems as interconnected systems. And this is where I get very excited. This is the slightly more blue sky fourth industrial revolution innovation space. And one of the, the aspects of this that I'm very excited about is concepts like biomimicry and ecomimicry to say that we're not the first organisms that have needed to think about what a resource efficient transport network would look like. Um, currently there's a study in, I think it's in Japan, where they're using a fungus to help them figure out what would be the most efficient railway network. And they do this by taking a map of the city, putting little bits of food and all the, um, all the dots that represent the key cities and areas that they want to service with the railway. And they allow a fungus to figure out how it would put out its feelers to make the most resource efficient network. So, and there are countless examples like that. Um, a lot of the, the swarm intelligence we see in bee and ant colonies has inspired the development of a lot of the smart technologies that we currently see being implemented as well. And from this perspective, South Africa is really in a fortunate space because we have so much rich biodiversity. And Tendo also mentioned we have incredible indigenous knowledge systems, and it would be in our benefit to draw from our natural wisdom instead of saying, let's constantly look at um, the West or Europe for how we would design a smart city for Africa. So Tendo also <laughs> mentioned working across departments. Um, I, I don't imagine that that excites anyone because I think we're all we all know how difficult it can be to collaborate, um, especially across departments. And I also just want to say that that's not that's not unique to local government. We have the same issues within the university. We call it silositis. Um, we suffer from silositis because we have ten faculties and the faculties really struggle to work together. Um, but if we really want our smart cities to work, we need to understand all the role players in the ecosystem and specifically how local government then fits in as a key stakeholder in that ecosystem. So the good news is that collaboration can be hard work at first, but if we start small with manageable projects around collaboration, it becomes easier. And there are many useful, very simple tools to use that can help us think about collaboration. So this I really like, um, it's called the City Model Canvas. So it's based on Business Model Canvas, which we often use um, for uh, social entrepreneurship development in our program. And Again, it's a self-explanatory self tool. It doesn't have complicated words, but it really helps you think about how do you identify key partnerships? What are the key activities you want to be thinking about? Whose buy-in and support would you need? And um, who are you trying to really benefit by, by this collaboration project that you have in mind? Um, it's a really useful mapping exercise. Um, you can... Uh, pull it apart and get different people to um, give you input on this. Um, and it's just one of many examples on how we actually map out our thinking around collaboration for smart city development. 
And then lastly, um, I mentioned this in the beginning, Tendo also spoke about it, that ultimately we're doing all of this work in order to benefit the people. Um, the city means nothing, the jobs, the buildings, the roads, the smart apps that tell you where to go. It doesn't mean anything if it doesn't make life better for people. So like Tendo said, it's, it's not about creating smart people. Um, it's really about who you invite to the table and how you listen to them. And again, there's so many very simple techniques to facilitate these kinds of conversations, things like design thinking, um, where you use low tech um, to engage with communities in a deep way. Um, Asset-based community development is a really useful strategy to, to use. And this is one of the things I think we do really well as South Africans, because connection is our language. We, we are a people-based people. We, we are community-centric. Um, so to listen deeply and to have empathy is, is, I think it comes naturally to us. And I think it's about being sure that we have the right voices around the design table. Again, the tech is the easy part when it comes to a smart city. It's really about whose buy-in you have and the thinking that supports how you're going to bring the smart technology in. Unfortunately, I don't think technology is going to save us, not from climate um, challenges, not from poverty and inequality. It can help us alleviate some of those issues, but only if we embed it in a system or a city that cares for its people and that takes care of its environment. So that is the end of our presentation. Um, thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, yeah, we're happy to be here and be part of the rest of the conversation this morning. All right, no, no, thank you, Dr. Rwanda and Ms. Tendo, the future doctor in the making. And Mr. and Bosch University, I appreciate all the inputs and thoughts you have shared. And I like the fact that you mentioned much about collaborations and um, definitely on the same page on that. And we can build further from that. And uh, I do believe we're on the right track as we bring in these quality thoughts from academia. But yes, let's not forget the ground, the operating environment of local government. And we are hoping that we can also touch base on those um, issues um, in a short while. Of course, we've got Mr. Philip De Brain, as I did make mention earlier, from Business Engineering, who then share some of his thoughts in this regard. So, uh, Dr. Rwanda and Ms. Tendo, just hang tang a bit, and then we'll come back to you with some of the comments and questions um, with regards to this. But before I bring um, Dr. Oh, I almost said Dr. De Brain, looks like I'm elevating <laughs> you, sir. Uh, it looks like you are headed there as well. Uh, yeah, I think in due time. But before I do, there's just a few uh, comments on the chat. Thank you so much to those that have uh, given us some more information around these issues of smart cities and innovation. Uh, Tynus Kruger, who I'm hoping he'll actually be joining uh, the panel as well, uh, just to share some thought around uh, the uh, framework of the smart cities in South Africa. So, but I did um, see that he will be leaving just before 11, because he's got an engagement from 11. So we'll make sure that we can just bring you in, Sam, for you to actually share some of your input in this regard. Also, Mr. Zonyane, you've also just shared um, what your organization that you're involved with, the ESO Consulting, or, um, or that you're involved in, or that organization, in terms of the future of cities and engagements that you have had and you provided those details. Thank you so much as well, Sam, in that regard. So now, let me then bring in um, Mr. DeBrain just to then touch on some of the issues from a local government perspective, and then we can take it from there. Thank Mr. you, DeBrain. thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ngobo, and thank you very much, um, uh, Rwenda and uh, Tender for the, for the very, very informative presentation. I think from a um, what we've seen since the advent 1920, uh, 19, <laughs> From 2018 um, onward, we've uh, 
we've we've seen a lot of things happen within the within the the smart city space, and everything um, went through a phase of being smart, and everybody wanted to be smart, and um, a great uh, guidance was given, I think, still today by government uh, through the smart cities framework, um, the district development model. There's a very interesting question from uh, to the fellow in the in the Q and A. Um, but what we saw happen um, in the last few years was firstly the advent of portals in local government. So most cities today have a portal where you can log on to and, and get a municipal account or lock a service request or a query, um, try and contact a counsellor. Now that in itself is was one of the first sort of steps at, at getting the service delivery or the ease of doing business going with regards to a smart city environment. Now, what we found is there's a lot of opinions, especially at local government level, but if you if you don't make it easier for communities to interact with you as a government organization or as a government institution, that it really defeats the object. Um, events management came sort of together with the with the portal environment, the launch of the portal, where you're now able to organize a cycle race in 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 Paul, for instance, um, and get all your approvals done and everything electronically. I mean, that is that speaks to um, speaks to some of the key components of the of the uh, smart city uh, framework. Um, we're now seeing apps every if it's not the municipality in the private sector. Many, many, many people are bringing out apps to. Uh, allow uh, to connect uh, communities with the with the municipal or with local government um, in environments. Some very effectively, some not so effective. And again, there where it's not effective, um, it's what uh, Dr. Lutz just touched on with regards to, you know, departments not speaking to each other, uh, single uh, communication interface into a specific organization. But it doesn't detract from the importance that from all levels of society, we are moving towards the smart environment. And I think everybody has embraced it, especially after uh, the, the, the pandemic we went through. Um, some of the municipalities that we work in, they were still able to provide bills. They were still able to provide services. The water came out of the taps. Um, so there wasn't this apocalyptic breakdown and primarily due to the use of, of city analytics and making sure that um, that we know what's happening in various areas. We might sometimes feel that we at the bottom part of um, of Africa, but I think if we just look around, you know, we really have made a lot of progress the last five, six years at small little interventions, but on a on a wide spectrum. So we're very excited. Um, just one last thing I'd might I'd like to close with, you know, um, touched on waste management and air quality, etc. So um, all around our country today are small little devices sitting and they're recording air quality. And it's happening today. It's happening right now in, in a great portion of our cities. Um, CNN and all the international um, broadcasting channels sometimes brings up an air quality map um, and shows you air quality across cities of the world. And those African cities, those South African cities, they get the information from these little probes that call a technology called Internet Over Things, the IoT technology, um, that has really been deployed without us even realizing that um, that that's happening. Um, so that's also very very exciting, um, Dr. Nova. I think that in in essence, sort of, would be my my close on the on the incorporation of, of the technology as we see it today in uh, in local government. No, thank you, sir. But. Just to further add on from your experiences in local government, um, have you seen a municipality that have really progressed technologically, you know, in the past, say, five years? And what has that been attributable to in, in your understanding when you've actually seen that progress? If there no. is a municipality that you're aware of that has actually progressed in this regard? There are a few municipalities. Um, you know, there's a municipality in the Overberg, Cape Regardless municipality, um, that use technology, smart technology, um, to pump water at certain peak peak hours at night, between I think one o'clock and four o'clock in the morning. They've realized that through smart metering, 
that they're able to access the electricity network at much reduced rates um, and fill the reservoirs. So that's one example. There's a few other examples. For instance, um, the BMW motorcycle company launched a new motorcycle um, 18 months ago. And that launch happened at the uh, Mossel Bay, at, uh, at the harbor. And the first time that anybody even knew that anything was going to happen at Mossel Bay was when the crates were delivered to the harbor. That whole application, the whole permitting, everything was done um, electronically through the use of uh, smart technology deployed through a portal and uh, event management, um, et cetera. So those are perhaps only two examples. One of the other examples that I can just quickly think of, if you just look at ease of doing business. So today it's possible for an architect to sit in uh, the city of Tuane or in Joburg or in Itekweni and submit a building plan for a dwelling in in Neisna, in George, in Frindal, in Clan William. So these are things that we are seeing. There's maybe just three or four examples that I can think of now, but these are real, real world, world examples that we see. The use of smart technology, this, the use of the deployment of the smart cities framework is working. Might not look like that when you walk outside and the two for one specials are not popping, popping up everywhere, but there are really progress being made in, in certain aspects. Um, you, you're having two conservatives, Seb. Also, I know that business engineering um, is involved in this. So don't be shy to make mention you. of, <laughs> of your good practices. No. So if there's anything you, you also want to touch on that, because, uh, you know, this issue of being practical and ensuring that we're not just theorizing. Yes, we need the research, we need the academia, but also obviously have to ensure that we blend the two and get what we require. So just from a business engineering uh, point of view, because I know you have done a few projects in this in this area, uh, maybe you can just maybe touch one or two that you, you, you know have been a success in a municipality environment. And so that as we then talk this through, at least there has been some elements that is actually out there and that can actually be used going forward. Yeah. So, so one of the one of the one of the key projects that we've been privileged to be involved in was with the uh, Western Cape government, where um, we've deployed a building control portal, um, and we've touched we shot to every single local municipality except the city because the city has their own um, own environment, own infrastructure, but very specifically went to look at the most rural municipalities like uh, a Prince Albert or a Canaland municipality in Lady Smith. Lanesburg municipality comes to mind, where we've enabled people to interact with those municipalities globally. So um, that's been really one of the projects that we've been very excited about to participate in. One reason being that um, when you look at a smart city environment, people typically rush to your, to your major center. But we forget that there are still People in the rural areas that need to that that need to benefit from from the technology. One of the other projects that we've been um, very excited to to work with was in in KZN um, in the Zululand district, where we've put up at the community centres and some at the taxi ranks uh, just sign a signboard. Okay, it's just a digital signboard. And what that was for was to just notify the community that there's cold weather approaching allowing them to get their livestock into environments um, uh, that are safe, heavy rain approaching, um, so that they can prepare um, uh, just to get their own environments um, uh, uh, safeguarded for for these adverse conditions. And then also, uh, SASA grants are going to be paid out on Tuesday afternoon at a certain extension. So informal or in, in, rather informative messages and then also very pertinent uh, detail with regards to um, the weather and how those conditions might affect communities. Uh, those are two things that come to mind now. Thank you very much. I don't know if you want me to elaborate. <laughs> no, I don't know. You can touch on those again later because I said we want this, this, this practice that is out there. Because, you know, similar to international best practices, we need them. Uh, we must learn from others. But obviously, we must find a way of uh, localizing these things and ensuring that we can actually get the outcomes that we desire in a local perspective. 
So that way I want us to drive into so that, yes, we've got this nice to have, but obviously whatever that we talk about can be implemented and then we can derive the results that we're looking for for our municipality. So thank you so much, um, Mr. Philip, for those um, thoughts. Uh, we just have a poll to bring up uh, from our discussion. We, just in about two minutes, uh, we can just look into our screens. Uh, that's the poll that we have just for today. In your view, observation, um, do you think there's been any innovation that you have heard of you know, in local government just in the past five years? Because there's been quite a, uh, a number of talks around this issue of municipal innovation, Salga as well as a municipal innovation magazine that they came up with some time back. And there are these maturity models um, that have also uh, cropped in with regards to innovation. In your view, um, what is your take on this in the past five years? Has there been any progress in this regard? The president is talking about smart cities. Everyone has been uh, touching on that as well, that um, he's, he wants to have some smart cities. Lanceria City is one of them that has been looked at. Right, so according to um, your take, uh, the 87% right now says yes, and 7% and 7% never paid attention to it. Uh, please do pay attention for those who have never paid attention. This is our cities, our municipalities, our local government. Uh, we just have to know what is happening and read um, about that. So thank you so much for that participation. Um, in this um, regard, as you can see, then those are the items um all the responses that we have received so let me just now uh put that off here we go let's proceed so at this time i'm going to be bringing in as i did make mention um tinas kruger uh, from csir which is the council for scientific and industrial research uh, that deals basically with some scientific and technology research and which then uh, contributes towards the industrial development and also supports the capable state. They put on the chat the issue of the framework for South African smart cities. I'm hoping that you can actually touch on that um, as he has just joined our panel this morning. Uh, Tynus, can you then come through on your side? You can unmute and then if you can then share some of your thoughts. And thank you so much as well for just availing yourself as we are part of the webinar. So we felt we've got some good uh, and useful information that then we just thought, let's bring you up into this conversation. Thank you so much, sir. Over to you. Yeah, thank you very much. And I'm glad that you mentioned that I've just been asked to be on this panel. So I am coming in completely unprepared and I have to rely on my knowledge and my memory. And um, as you can see, I'm at the age where memory is not something that you brag about. But anyway, thank you very much. I do appreciate it. Um, my name is Tines Kruger and I am with the CSIR. And just a quick background so that you also understand, like Rwenda, where I'm coming from. Um, a, a slightly different background. I am at the moment what we call a research group leader for a group called Housing and Urban Studies. So the work that we're involved with deal with deals with everything related to the planning, design and management of human settlements. Not everything, obviously, but there's too much, but so. Uh, my background, um, I'm an architect by training. I don't really commit architecture at the moment, but it obviously is very useful in the work that we've been doing for the past, well, I've been involved with this for the past 32 years at the CSIR. So um, we recently started looking at smart cities. My background is really in, in, in crime prevention through environmental design, and um, but uh, it, we, we did not, could not really get the type of funding because apparently we do not have a crime problem in the country. So when we started hearing about the, the president's speech, the first one about um, smart cities, we realized that uh, we, as the CSIR, as a national resource, will have to do some research into this because we know how people see smart cities and the visions that we see. And you'll see in the framework, we do not have a single picture of a smart city that you would normally see when people advertise smart cities with flying cars and everything is beautiful because we from the start realized that we need to understand the South African context and if we say what does a South African city look like you just have to go to Kaya and to the Cape Town city center and then to a small town and you'll see 
and then to any of the other old township areas and you'll see that there is no such thing as a typical South African city, like in, in many other countries. But the concern for us was that people are going to think that smart cities will solve our problems. And that's when we started doing research, trying to understand our context, especially regarding poverty, inequality, and um, yeah, the lack of, 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 of real employment, unemployment. So we started working with the Department of Cooperative Governance to develop this framework. And I'm glad to see that the framework was extensively used in your presentation tender, but I would just as an aside suggest that you make reference to the document. A lot of the information that you've used comes straight from that document. And I know that someone at Department of Cooperative Governance would at least like the document to be acknowledged. And so would I, I'm one of the co-authors. Um, so, our concern was really that people are going to see, like I said, the technology and what, and I don't want to step on any toes, Philip or anyone, but I, we, we've seen often that um, especially large international technology companies would be able to, uh, they have the budget and the people to go to a lot of cities and towns and present themselves as their technology partner. Now, the concern with that, that we've seen in our research is that they have a a technology solution that they just want to find a problem for. And often, and that's why some of those principles in the framework are so clear, do not be technology driven. You must understand your, your real problem and then you see, will the technology actually make the difference? Or, and, and the, the stupid example that we always use, a lot of people think that sensors will be the answer to everything. It's no use having a sensor telling you that there is no water in the pipe. And people, believe it or not, that sometimes think that all we need is the sensors to tell us something. But if there's no water in the pipe, that, there's a different problem. Or if you do not have at your municipality the people to do the maintenance. An app or a sensor is not the, the, the answer. And I think that often is something that, that smaller local um, municipalities often see as, um, you, you know, if, if we just start there, but they do not understand that you need people to run it, people to understand, also talk about big data, but if you do not have the people to analyze the big data, number one, and to number two, say, what do we then do with it? Data in itself is nothing if you do not know what to do with the data. And that is also something that we sometimes see that um, officials do not understand. So our plea with this framework was really, please understand so that you do not create more problems for yourself in future, more um, in financial troubles in future. And also specifically, I think, let's not increase the digital divide. We, we know that there are many apps that you can only, for instance, here in, in, in Gauteng, with Swana, where I'm sitting, you can only make an appointment to get your driver's license renewed through a website. And that is almost impossible. And I've been there where people, older people, not only, let's say, people that do not have access to the funding for technology, but people who just do not understand technology. They can't make appointments. So they're completely excluded. And I think that is the type of thing. If you look at the new, and I should perhaps not say this, the new app by one of our government institutions on potholes, um, I would like to see how that app is going to fix the bottle. But um, that's another story. So maybe to summarize, our, our plea is do not be blinded by the technology alone. Obviously, technology has a huge role to play. But please make sure that you understand where it is appropriate and where not. And um, I think because I didn't prepare, I'm going to stop here because I may say something that I will regret. <laughs> no, thank you so much, um, Mr. Tainas. I think for me, that's what makes the conversations uh, interesting as well, because there are different perspectives, uh, different school of thoughts um, that we obviously we are sharing here because we all want to find solutions and improve our local government. And, um, you know, it's, I'm, I'm just glad that you're coming from your perspective, you know, we do research and all of that, which is very good and we, we need that. And obviously, uh, Mr. Philip on the other side, as well as I did indicate, is more on the ground, uh, you know, in terms of what he does uh, with municipalities. But also, I, I don't want to leave you out, Mr. Philip, if you perhaps you want to 
touch on some of what uh, Mr. Tanas has spoken about from the technology aspect of things, so that perhaps you may have just don't want to share your viewpoint as well um, from what he has just touched on. Mr. Philip? I think Dennis has nailed, uh, uh, hit the nail on the head. I mean, um, this is what we see, the practical side of the of the technology component with the apps, for instance. Um, so now you know you've got 455,000 bottles. It doesn't mean that you know how to fix them or that you have the capacity to fix them. I think at this stage with regards to the technology is the discovery. It's just to make sure that we can actually get the information to a centralized point. However, again, speaking to ease of doing business, um, the business needs to be done. Um, so, so I think Tinas is, is is very very correct in his in his summation of the of the constraints. And yes, it's not only about technology. And technology costs money in the longer in the long run. You know, it might start off looking like um, an affordable option, but there are smaller areas that that you can't that you can't necessarily um, cost effectively address. One of the things is that, and it's critical, it's this it's this whole issue about the digital divide. I mean, we really have to be mindful of not excluding a great portion of our constituents through the use of technology. Something that for to this forum might seem very exciting, might have no bearing on somebody else, actually might frustrate them, make their lives dif more difficult. Like, for instance, obtaining a driver's license or getting a passport, or those are things that we face with now that I'm concerned with the regards to the fact that it's it's not inclusive enough. And now I don't I'm, you know I'm not sure. We need to explore that. Yeah, thank you, sir. Um there's a, a comment from the uh, question and answer section uh, from Estelle Orton from Site Plan. Thank you for this relevant topic. I've attended another meeting, but I'd like to receive a copy of the recording. We are working with EDC and Towns Action Network to put together solutions, metrics from municipalities, da, da, da. You can read that. But it looks like, um, Mr. The Brain, you've got somebody that actually wants to engage with you. So the details are there. I'm sure that you can then um, engage further on that note. So um, also, Tolo Fellow, we have noted your question. We'll just touch on it uh, shortly after I bring on um, Mr. Danny Nolte, who also just want to share his input with regards to this conversation, he's been listening so attentively. So now I'm going to give you a chance, Mr. Note, to come in and also add your inputs into the subject matter, and then we'll continue from there. Mr. Note? Yes, uh, well, it's, it's still good morning. Yes, uh, and I've, I've been listening attentively to all the various views, uh, and, I've, and I noted that there's some uh, comments that are sort of repeated uh, by by all the you know the, the presenters so far um, I heard the word silos quite a number of times uh, and I think that is definitely something that that inhibits us developing uh, I would rather call it efficient cities than smart cities perhaps uh, you know smart sounds like we have to do things I don't know in a different totally different way, smart uh, getting new things and what have you, and not doing the, you know, the basic things right, which I think is the you know, is also the idea that I'm getting out. Um, I'm part of a team that is at the moment working on uh, a process of, of, of looking at the planning at uh, municipalities. And I think to, to incorporate all these different ideas that have been uh, put forward now, uh, I, I think that's where we have to start. And and one of the things that we've identified is to, at a municipal level, to start by getting the different managers in the municipality to start working together. To, in other words, to break down the, the, the barriers between the silos within municipalities first. In other words, we form a, we form a you know, what's now known... Uh, mostly as the, as the uh, uh, management committee uh, to get them to actually work together on planning aspects uh, regarding asset, uh, assets and the management of assets. Because we believe that the assets of the municipality forms uh, the core of the, 
of the delivery of the constitutional mandate. Uh, so we, we feel that's where we need to start. And there is a window of opportunity at the moment. Um, as you all know, we've gone through, you know, an election process in the last uh, municipal financial year. Um, there was not sufficient time for, for the new councils to review all their integrated development plans. So they've more or less sort of adopted what was there before, but they now have an opportunity to just stand back, re-look really at this, and, and then as a team, and I'm talking here, firstly, the technocrats, the, the management teams, to work on that and present something to the councils that would, uh, that would change the way we are doing things, because I think we all agree uh, that we need to do things differently. Um, I know the discussion has been a lot about cities, um, and and I'm uh, and I and I heard and I saw one of the questions as well was about uh, district development models. So we we have to I think we have to expand our thinking, not only thinking about the cities because uh, quite a lot of people are living outside the the metros as we know them, uh, and yes, the, there are certain rules and certain things that we can do in metros that we most probably cannot do in the rest of the district. So we have to slightly adapt or adopt a different attitude there to make things work. Uh, but the, in essence, the, 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 the concept of the district development model is, is, is very, very uh, doable and it is very, very necessary. And indeed, uh, it's been prescribed in the municipal legislation for almost 20 years already. And we haven't been complying with that to start off with. So yes, we have to, we have to start working. And I'm glad to hear there are lots of people, lots of different institutions working on ways and means to improve things for, for the communities. Uh, and that, that would, must be our, our ultimate focus uh, for, for to make sure that the communities are better off whatever ways we use, whether we use uh, different information technology, devices, apps, whatever, uh, but also the physical things that we must put in place. Uh, that uh, I believe that that is something we need to change now. Um, we, have a, we have a chance um, over the next couple of months. Um, I think the, 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 the planning uh, processes for for the 23, 24 uh, IDP budget cycle that this is as commenced at most municipalities. Um, I think the uh, one of the items there that, that already is a problem is the, uh, the, the synchronization between the spatial development frameworks and the integrated development plans. There's already, uh, that is not always given the necessary attention uh, but that is required, and I think that's where we need to start and say, okay, what is required? Let's have a look on the ground. What do the communities need? You know, so improve our demand management and then start from there onwards. There are lots of guidance on how to go about, you know, the rest of the processes. But um, you know, I've, I'm part of a team, and I'm I'm passionate about this. Uh, Dr. Norbo knows I'm. Uh, I'm a very passionate uh, asset management uh, person. I believe municipalities must start there because uh, that's the only way we can provide services to, to the community. What I do believe as well, and I've worked on that as well, uh, is that we must ensure that there's economic development. Uh, you know, the, the, the uh, we've been focusing on, and, and, uh, and I saw Tina's career spoke about, you know, the human settlements and all of that, but uh, we've been building housing uh, and lots of houses all over and pro providing services to those houses, uh, but there was no accompanying uh, economic development. There was no industry. There was no nothing. So there was no jobs for the people in those houses where they can go and earn money so they can afford the services that are being supplied. 
all this, uh, you know, we can see that now. We can see the evidence in, in what's happening in, you know, illegal connections and people not paying for services. And, you know, we've, we're paying the price now, but uh, I think it's urgent that we, that we start and putting all these uh, considerable expertise and, uh, you know, the, the willingness of, of all, the, all the different role players, put it all together in this country as a whole and start at the municipal level to change things. Um, so, yeah, uh, Dr. Ngova, I think that's where I need to stop now. You know me, I can talk for hours. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but, but, but just the other point that I, I just needed to maybe put through as well, with regards to the ESG goals and local government, because there is this push of, you know, the smart cities and all of that going forward. But are we really looking into that as local government? Because I know that you have touched a bit um, previously, but it then fits in very well uh, with this outlook of smart cities. But are we actually catering for the environment and all of those, which I'm also trusting that um, Dr. Rwanda will also come in as well thereafter with regards to this um, sustainable development for local government. But just to your views, and then Dr. Rwanda will come in there. I'm glad you reminded me of that uh, because it's also uh, something that's very important. Uh, if we're looking at, at how we're doing things from here onwards, uh, we have to consider the ESG factors for those of you most probably that you don't know what it means, environmental, social and governance. Um, so uh, if we look at corporate South Africa, they've done a lot of work to, to improve there is G. Uh, I've I've seen some, you know, co comments from them uh, from one of the big players uh, where they've they've improved, for example, the uh, the usage of, of of energy in all their in all their setups where they've uh, where they now creating well they've put solar panels up on all the buildings, all the big buildings that they have, and then they're storing uh, energy like. You know, you know, in the buildings as well to make sure that they can run and they're not reliant on, on external electricity all the time, but also they're saving. Um, and I think that is the important part of it is that they, they said uh, it, it, it must be a financial saving. And we, we, we should not be spending more money to be compliant to, to the, and I think the uh, we had the SDGs, the, the Sustainable Development Goals from the United Nations. We, we, we should be able to, to utilize that, implement methods to, in actual fact, save money. Um, I know another thing that they've done is they, they're harvesting rainwater to a large extent. And in our country, we are a water-scarce country. And you, frighteningly enough, uh, a lot of the water is now being contaminated because we're not doing our purification, you know, uh, regarding the wastewater properly. Uh, that is a frightening prospect that, you know, we that we are going in, in the wrong direction as far as that's concerned. But uh, so we have to, whenever we're doing any of these improvements, when we're ever getting up, up smarter, smarter, more efficient, yes, uh, we we should be making sure that we improve that, the ESG. The social part of it, obviously, is, you know, the social economic part is, is how are we treating the people, uh, our the employer, employees, and as well, very importantly, the communities. And as I said already, we, we are not uh, generating plans for them. The, the, the local economic development uh, is not happening. I know a lot of districts have been you know they've established uh, units where they that is their focus to to uh, you know to, to to make sure that there is improvement uh, in the economic activity within the district and i think that aligns now yet again with the district development model that we you know that we interact we if we if we're talking about economic development we we must uh, you know link that up to what are we doing as far as the servicing of that is concerned so the, 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 the service delivery and the economic development actually go hand in hand if we say we're planning uh, for the future, integrated development planning.
that's what it means. Um, so yeah. we now we have to do a retake, restart, yeah. refocus. Thank you, thank you, uh, Mr. Nolte, for that. Um, I also just noted another comment from Dombi. Um, indicating one of the success factors cited for smart cities is, is smart governance. In the light of bad governance um, prevalent in most of municipalities, how is it possible to have the concept of smart cities feasible? That's why we're looking at the issue of governance as well, and hence then touching on that particular aspect as well. But let me then bring in um, Dr. Rwanda, just to also add some to what has been shared, especially also from that sustainable development point of view from what we are discussing, then we'll then touch on some of the questions that have been posed through to us and then others can engage from there. Dr. Rwanda? I, I really liked the point. Um, I think it was Daniel that made the notes about the language we use when we talk about smart cities and, and that really resonated for me. This um, language matters and even sometimes in the word using smart cities, we may actually even be alienating the stakeholders that we, we want to invite into the conversation. So I really like that suggestion around efficient cities, livable cities, maybe a bit more than, than smart cities. Um, and I mean, we can argue that it's semantics, but it, it does matter. Um, I saw there was a, a question um, in the chat, um, Muzikaise, I hope I got that right. Um, very good question about stakeholder engagement across age groups. And um, Tendor, maybe you want to back me up on this. So we've got this amazing opportunity to work with, with youngsters, right? So we work with mostly school leavers and up until they're like mid-20s. And it's, I, I really think that, you know, that's why I get up in the morning and I do this job because I, I have to be hopeful because I work with young people and we're looking to their generation to fix enormous problems that they really didn't have a hand in creating. You know, they're, they're going to bear the brunt of climate change. They're going to bear the brunt of a lot of the, um, inequalities that are coming home to roost even more and more, and then the effects of a pandemic that we've never had before. So it's a, it's a strange space, but it's a good space to be in because I think they need to go and fix this. So it forces me to be helpful because I cannot engage young people and say like, oh, it's just gloom and doom, right? Because then, then why even bother? And, and I've really, I really enjoy that part of my job because it forces me to look at innovations, to look at what is hopeful and good. Um, and I think one of the big things that we fundamentally believe is that um, small is beautiful. So I really liked some of the examples that Philip shared um, because it's, it's not the big, amazing, smart, designs oftentimes it's about finding really small projects doing them well and then finding ways that we can connect and and build um i think there was there was a question that had this phrase about building from the bottom up and and i think that works i think that's um oftentimes what we need from government perspective is to work alongside the initiatives that the community has already established those are my random thoughts, but I'm running out of my energy caffeine fueled thinking. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Ruenda. Uh, let's bring in uh, Tendu as well, uh, perhaps just to add some of the uh, inputs from what you have shared. And then, um, Mr. Tanis, I'll bring you in because I know that you're going to be running away shortly. But, uh, Ms. Tendu, if you have any thoughts as well to this conversation. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. I think uh, I really like uh, what uh, Philip, uh, Mr. De Brain was saying that, you know, some of these smart cities initiatives also they have been here, but also I think coming back uh, to Moses' uh, question of, you know, how do you try to create something that includes everyone? Uh, sometimes that is almost impossible to do because, I mean, different generations experiences different challenges. And how you do it is that, you know, we are fortunate in South Africa that we also have people of different ages in different working spaces. 
So I will feel that the, the corresponding age group that understand the issues of their age group, it can actually be the one that can help to facilitate that space. And that is not discouraging that we can call in, we can call share, but it's also trying to acknowledge the fact that we don't understand these things at the same place. For example, me born in the 80s, I don't really understand how to use TikTok. I don't even know what people are doing. So imagine my mother, imagine the other people, but then I understand the fact that, you know, born in the 80s, I understand that a person needs three email addresses, one for important thing, two for friends, and other for signing up for random stuff on the internet. So that's something that we can try to look into that, you know, how do you have this co-learning with according to the appropriate or relatable people into that space? Yeah, thanks. No, thanks, uh, Ms. Tendo. I liked what you just made mention there in the last part, that co-learning and a cross-pollination of what we're actually doing, because I think that becomes important because local government, we always say it's another animal. There's so many uh, stakeholders um, that are involved in local government, not just from a municipal um, ground only, but there's so much, the cocktails, the sagas, um, everybody that is uh, coming into our system, obviously improve, uh, find ways of improving local government, but definitely it has to be in an integrated manner as Daniel Noto was actually uh, speaking about earlier. And then we're hoping that these models that are now coming up can actually seek to ensure that. But this time then, let me just bring in Mr. Tynus and um, just for your closing thoughts and remarks into this, and then we can release you, sir, for that next engagement that you have. Thanks very much for that. Um, I do not have much more to say because I think listening to everyone now, we, I think there's a convergence about what we should try and achieve in South Africa. And that was the, the scene was set by the initial presentation from Tendo and Rwanda. It, it, it really, is, I think we have the same sympathies, I think, towards what a, a, a smart city in South Africa would be. Based on just one of the things, there's a, there was one co comment there from uh, Ndombi about smart governance. And yes, we must also always understand that Smart can mean many, many things. It's not necessarily technology, it's processes. It could be just doing something slightly different in the way that you govern your city. But I think the key there is the poor governance that we are experiencing. And that is one of the other reasons why we thought we need to make people aware of the limitations and the opportunities for technology. Because do not expect yet again, that if you have poor governance, that a technology of sorts or a new process that no one understands will make the difference. So governance and, and good governance is critical, absolutely critical. Um, one other aspect that I think that, and I think it was mentioned by um, Mr. Nolte also about sometimes doing the basics right is the smart thing to do. You do not have to go and find something else. If you are not doing your basic service delivery duties, then just doing that will already make the difference and will, will change the way that your citizens feel because the citizen in the end, as we've all said this morning, is the most important aspect here. And then yeah, just one other aspect that I want to mention is that um, a lot of cities, and we've, we've done some research, we looked at many cities and towns and basically just the information that you can find online there's no such thing as the ultimate smart city. It's always a process. We believe that we, we prefer to talk about smart initiatives in a city and not a smart city because we've seen in South Africa, some cities tell us that they're the smartest city in South Africa and that's because they've got an app where you can pay your water and electricity. Um, and they always wanna be measured. I think that is the wrong motivation to be measured according to your smartness. I think what we need to understand is how smart ready are you before you embark? on a smart initiative in your city. And sometimes, and it's always chunk size, that um, circle, that uh, that tender that you showed that comes from the framework, that those are all the aspects. But in, in and we know that you have to pick one. Where are, where's, where would it, your, you get best bang for your buck? If you invest in a smart initiative in certain areas where it will absolutely not make any difference, then you've wasted your money. So we as the CSR, we are busy finalizing a 
framework that we call the Smart City Investment Prioritization Framework to assist you in understanding where you need to invest your money and where you should rather not because you're going to waste your money. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Sorry that I have to leave, but um, uh, thanks for, for giving me the chance to also share what the CSR is doing. No, no, we appreciate your time as well, sir, um, that you have given unto us. Thank you very, very much. And we're hoping to definitely have this engagement further as we proceed and we can, as you rightly said, uh, find an expression and a way of converging all of that we are doing and all these different stakeholders in local government. I'm involved in quite a number of structures within local government and I do quite a number of uh, research as well in the area of local government. And as Dr. Rwanda did indicate, uh, he, yeah, it can be looking as doom and gloom when we'll look at the stats of municipalities across the country in terms of the issues at hand, the audit outcomes that are there, service delivery challenges that are there. But yes, we've got a chance um, for, from ourselves and everyone that is working in local government to make that change um, for the future. And I'm just glad that these conversations are actually taking us in that state. So thank you so much um, to Tynus. And then at this time, I just want to uh, bring in again, um, Mr. De Brene from the technology aspect that, that keeps on creeping up in governance. Um, perhaps is the way of actually converging this in some form or the other that can actually assist municipalities, especially from an efficiency point of view, because we can't be keeping on talking smart cities. I think Mr. Nota presented us that good word as well of maybe the efficient part of it, but we can't divorce the governance into it. But I know that technology can then play a role in ensuring that we can actually undertake that. Your views on that? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Novo. Yes, um, I think... <laughs> Governance is a is a is an aspect that that needs to be or is aimed to be addressed through 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 many initiatives at the moment. Um, uh, all the frameworks and the policy um, guidelines that are given are really, in essence, focusing on on the quality of 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 governance, which also sort of directly speaks to the quality um, of service delivery. And if I could, taking from from what Daniel and Tinas have, have have said earlier. You, and the question from Solofeda, which I think is really an important question, uh, that needs that it 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 needs a detailed uh, debate with regards to the district development model. You know, if we take a, a initiative, you know, we've got 44 district municipalities and 226 local municipalities in South Africa, and that excludes the metros, serving about 60 million odd uh, citizens. Um, it's daunting. Um, so I don't know how we're going to fix the problem if we don't use technology. Te technology is going to have to be applied um, in some way or form to assist us. But if we, for instance, can connect a building control officer in Toyando with a engineer in um, Kimberley, where the engineer is able to provide assistance to um, a construction project happening in Toyanda on, on a completely different edge of the of the country, that's a smart initiative that we should encourage. That's just one example that that one can use. There are many things being said about telemedicine and all these other aspects, but I think in the health area as well, um, just getting advice, information um, to to local households on a national basis. Um, could also be an area of, 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 of great value. But again, it's difficult to group these things and say that this is the smartest city in the country or that is the smartest city in the country. I think everybody must do something that could be considered as smart um, to assist the local communities that, that they serve. And the capacity is our big problem. Um, and again, technology can assist us where we have capacitation issues. Um, we've lost um, uh, our direction a bit with the uh, service delivery components in many municipalities in South Africa. Um, you know, we talk a lot about many things, but what the reality is that in some towns we don't have a functioning fire brigade. So, you know, how smart's that? Um, <laughs> so we've got many things to, to look at um, under this blanket of... Uh, of the smart cities development framework and uh, the SGDs and everything else that, that 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 goes with that. I am in closing. I'm very very excited 
to be in South Africa at this time. Um, I think there's huge opportunity for everybody that wants to participate to really make significant difference uh, to the betterment of everyone. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Ngobo. No, certainly, sir. And that's why we're still around and we'll continue to be around until Amen. we can see <laughs> we can see that change. Uh, uh, because some of us, you know, when I got into local government, it was a more of a career for me when I started back in the days. And then as you got into it, you realize, no, this is a calling that one is on so we just have to do what is required and as we rightly say all we do at the end and ultimately is to ensure that communities um receive the services that they ought to be receiving from local government all these things we're talking about it's nice yes we must do all of those things but ultimately it's that service delivery that must be there and people receive the water the light um the filling up of those potholes and all of that within our local government. and but, but obviously, there has to be these talks, there's with these frameworks and everything that will shape and mold to where we are actually going. Um, at this time, because we are about to round off, most of the questions that were posed, I think all our speakers and or the panel members have touched upon, but I will be giving um, last thoughts to be shared um, Mr. Philip, I'm realizing that you have your hand up. You want to come in on something? That, that was a mistake. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. I, no, I clicked on the Q&A and the hands next to it. Sorry about that. Okay, no stress. It's, it's not the age factor. Uh, not worry, Mr. Philip. Just, yeah. Just <laughs> <the name. laughs> All right. So just indicating that most of the questions um, have been more or less answered, but I will be giving a chance to all our panel members just to have some closing thoughts. I will start with your good self, Mr. Daniel Nolte. But if um, on your closing, closing thought, you can also just touch on that question um, on the Q&A, just to go on it again by Tolo Fellow. Um, Mr. Flip did touch on it as well. But if you can just have a look, is it possible to argue that the DDM um, district development model should prioritize transforming local municipalities into future smart cities rather than constructing or designing smart cities from the ground up? So as you give your closing thoughts, if we can also just touch on that aspect and then we'll move on forward from there. Thank you. Yeah, I get another chance to talk. I, I, I like that. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, this is such a, uh, a interesting group of people uh, with all different ideas and different angles on, on the same subject. Uh, uh, I was just uh, thinking about smart cities and the, the technology involved. Uh, one of my erstwhile colleagues uh, was invited to go to China to, uh, to visit the city there uh, and to see how they're doing things. And, and it's very, very smart. And I'm not, but I'm not sure it's what we want in our country because uh, they had a control room where they could actually do facial recognition on everybody on the street. Uh, so they could they could follow you. you I don't know. It's a, it's a bit of a loss of privacy. I think you can't go anywhere, and you and, and it's and it's noted by the control people at the municipality. Uh, but they had certain uh, you know very interesting aspects there where they were linked up with industry and where they were, for example, they were uh, uh, boilers where they were uh, heating up certain metals, etc. Uh, they could monitor the the temperatures on that from the control room, and should it see exceed a certain temperature, they could they would immediately alert all the necessary the fire brigade. They had one in the area, uh, and uh, you know the closest hospital that there could be. You know there there is a a possible disaster. So that is, uh, I think that's very smart, but. I, I don't think it's, you know, at the moment, that's where South Africa, where we we want to go. Um, I just want to go back to, you know, what I'm, the, the, the point I made earlier is that everything and, and everybody has been mentioning potholes and water supply and electricity and all of that. So are you talking uh, assets, asset management, um, that is that is the critical thing. And I think that is, we all recognize that that is where our attention should be. Um, and at the moment, uh, working in silos, having the community services on the one side trying to build more sports stadiums, uh, whilst you know somebody else is trying to fix potholes and uh, somebody else is trying to make sure that there's enough electricity going around, 
uh, that's you know that's not we we're not working together the silos are not you know functioning as one and i think that's our that's that's our, 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 our point where we should depart from now to say let's first get the hands together uh, we suggested uh, you know dedicated asset management committees at a local municipal level as well as a district uh, municipal level uh, and then getting involved in the in the strategies uh, you know regarding each municipality deciding there what what is the way forward because we have to do a retake now we have to address this crisis that we are in as such as far as service delivery is concerned you can just have a look at the the number of of, of protest actions around the country i mean it's in the hundreds uh, you know it, it's it's obvious an obvious indication that we're not being efficient we we, we must do something immediately what we've noticed now with our interaction with the various government departments and uh, various role players, uh, you know, in, as far as asset management is concerned, uh, amazingly enough, uh, there is no uh, dedicated asset management uh, training course from the National School of Government or right through all the tertiary institutions. Uh, so, and then at the, at the municipal level, uh, many municipalities do not even have an asset management unit, a dedicated asset manager, somebody just putting all of this together. You know, if, you, if you're saying, yes, we, we need to manage assets and we need to satisfy the needs of the community, and I'm talking now all the needs, service needs, as well as the socioeconomic needs, uh, let, let alone the governance problems that we have but uh, if we want to do that we, we we need to build up capacity at the municipality so we need to employ knowledgeable people in asset management specifically in that uh, and to to put all of that together so that must be part of the plan if we go forward now we must identify what do we need as far as resources are concerned at the you know on the ground um, and I think that's where the district development or the districts then uh, that can become a very important, a critical uh, element because a lot of the, the expertise that is required, if you say you need an electrical engineer, we don't have enough electrical engineers to go around uh, all the municipalities that are in fact supplying that, but we can most probably get dedicated electrical engineers on a district level. You, you, you must have that. You must have an electrical engineer. I think it's one of the necessary requirements for any municipality to supply electricity. But be it as it may, we need, we need to be able to say, we can certain of the services, definitely we can have on a district level uh, and, and share that. Actually, a lot of districts are already sharing, uh, you know, quite a lot of the services. I've, I know personally of some of them that are sharing the the GIS, uh, you know, uh, the, the the capacity around that to make sure that you know they have the the right people that can manage that on the district level and at each uh, municipal level. Uh, in case at end we have the situation where the districts do water and sanitation and the local municipalities do roads and stormwater, so they have you know different sets of 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 GIS or different frameworks. Um, I like the idea that, uh, and, and, and I think Randolph uh, spoke about the, you know, the, 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 the mimicry that we can do. I, uh, I think Dr. Novo might remember, I, I used the analogy of the human body uh, last year at the, at the asset management in Darbar where we have all these different systems um, you know, cardiovascular and, and the nervous system and, uh, you know, the, the respiratory system and the uh, digestive system and all of that. But then we had have the endocrinal system that that's sort of in control of that. And I think we can apply that to, you know, to our, our municipality as well. Uh, maybe the endocrinal system is you know, sort of IT related and all of that is, uh, and, I, and I think we, we had the discussion last week about the connectivity that's that's still a problem in cities it's a lot easier than 
in the rural areas, et cetera. But, you know, that's all, all things that can be worked on, you know, over a period of time where we can get better, where we can get more efficient. Um, but, you know, let's, let's all get all the necessary expertise as much as possible. And I like the idea, uh, you know, business engineering. It sounds, it sounds like something that's very necessary in the municipal space. Uh, public leadership, yes. Uh, you know, the, the CSIR, the, you know, the, the, the scientific, uh, you know, uh, background of all of this uh, and then the development planners and we should get all of that together and, 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 and then us as, as local government experts on various fields uh, of, uh, I, I actually started off as a, as a financial uh, consultant to municipalities and I'll, I'll, I'll say it softly, I started with the Auditor General, but okay, I left that uh, and then became a financial consultant and, and eventually, you know, uh, 20 years ago, went across to, 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 to asset management uh, when it became obvious that that is an area that you, if you want to become good at it, you have to really concentrate on what is going on there. Um, and and I've been involved in in that and that I still believe that is that is the, the the essence of what we should focus on now is make sure we get that part of it right. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Nota, giving us a class there as well on biology and all these systems in the body. Uh, but it's a very good analogy because we need the body to work and function. And so is local government of ours, and hence uh, the discussions that we are having here this morning. It looks like we're going to have an early lunch as we're about to uh, close off for, to, for today's session. But before I do, let me just bring in the last thoughts as well. I'll start with your good self, Dr. Rwanda, then we can then pass on to Ms. Tendo thereafter, and then um, Mr. Debrenia will then close off as well from his side. And thanks as well, um, Dr. Rwanda. I saw some comments as well. and throwing on a few things as well to the progressive uh, land on the other side. Thanks for those comments on the chat. You can go through now. Sure. Um, yeah, I think it's, it, I was just reflecting a little bit more about that question around how we involve different people, different age groups, different interests. And, and I guess what I often struggle with is different value systems. Um, you know, um, I, I do think I come across as the hippie in the area that I live in. So I don't have a concrete answer, but I do think that one of the big things around community stakeholder engagement is intention and that we have to have some patience when we do that. We don't build relationships overnight. Um, and I think if our intentions are clear and honest and transparent um, and we're willing to do that work, we'll reap the benefits um, of that. So I might have to organize a neighborhood bride to get them to understand why we need to recycle. Um, I'll keep you posted on my progress. Um, yeah, and then I won't, if I get started on biomimicry, I will keep you here for a very long day. But I think one of the, the beautiful examples that nature does really well is short feedback loops. Um, and I remember there's a documentary we always show our students. I think it's the economics of happiness. And there's a guy who has this beautiful analogy of saying that Part of our sustainability challenges, and I think this is especially true in how we've designed our cities, is that our arms have become so long, we don't know what our hands are busy with. And what nature does differently is to have short feedback loops. And our bodies are a great example. So when you have your early lunch and you eat food, your body immediately says sugar is incoming and it releases the right amount of enzymes to bring your blood sugar levels back to normal. And then it also knows when it's at normal. So it switches off the enzyme that lowers your blood sugar. So we need to think about those um, feedback loops when we're thinking about smart slash efficient cities. And just really think about how do we track and, and measure and respond fast when we put in, um, when we think about the systems, specifically the physical systems we need to manage in our cities. Um, yeah, so thank you very much again for this opportunity. It was lovely to spend the morning with you. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. You know, I feel like uh, I always appreciate these platforms because, you know, it gives you like some of the holistic perspective and understanding and we are able to share like some of the idea. So I think what I really like uh, for Mr. Nolte is that, you know, 
you need maybe what I could take out from that is that you need university also producing matching skills with what is actually required. And I think if we do not have this kind of platform where we can sit and listen to what the local government is required, we are also not able to design the syllabuses within the university space that is matching what is currently needed. Uh, I mean, last year I had my student on sustainable cities model where I took them down to Forest Hill, Fuleni, Philippi on the sustainable cities. They were so confused because they were like, we thought you're gonna be telling us about Dubai and things, but I was like, this is our city. This is the cities that we need to fix. So I think also the industry or the local government shouldn't be shy to mentioning that universities, you're not producing the people that actually match what we need. They also need to start coming into the table, tell us because my approach to this, it came because I also have an, a little bit of working experience in the industry. So I'm able to understand that it's not all about what's in the textbook, but it's also about what we can learn in reality and also which matches what is going on in our city. So I look forward to maybe seeing some future engagements between local government and some of the academic spaces. I think I will be really open into those kind of conversations in the future, especially around the higher education curriculum design. Thank you. Yo, thank you, um, Dr. Tendo Tubi and Dr. Rwenda there on that. Uh, certainly, that is what we are aspiring for. The first session of the conversation where we had the National School of Government, we actually touched on that curriculum relook and redesign so that it can be fit for purpose in terms of our learners when they get absorbed into the system. So that is something that is taking place. And certainly from our side as well, because I do sit in two advisory board uh, of universities, and that's the challenge we've actually discovered that some of the curriculum that is there is not exactly talking to what is happening um, in the sector, the public sector at large. So the, those are some of the conversations that definitely we must have going forward. And as we've started these local government conversations, as part of it is to ensure, as I've been saying, to bring in the academics, to also then bring in the practice let's converge, let's find a way of ensuring that there is balance between those two key areas. So thank you so much as well, um, Ms. Tendo, for those inputs. Um, Mr. Debrain, your last thoughts, sir? Thank you, Doctor. I really don't have much to, to add to what I've already said. It's just that for me, it'll always be um, that we will all just recognize the power of technology. It's the one great equalizer that we have access to. Um, Everybody with a phone, um, it doesn't have to be a smartphone. We can make a difference in that person's life if we if we all pull together. And again, as I said earlier, um, I'm very, very excited about this, this uh, smart city initiatives in general. Yes, there are many caveats and pitfalls and, and things we have to navigate and circumnavigate, but um, there's no other way to solve our issues um, than with technology. Thank you for the opportunity to, to participate, and uh, thank you, thank you, everyone. So, Siabonga, uh, Mr. Philip Debrene from Business Engineering, and you, uh, as said, uh, you know, from our side, truly, you know, you always honor us by coming through for these sessions and adding your inputs. Uh, we truly, truly honor and appreciate that uh, very much, sir. So at this time, um, we are coming to a close. There's been um, some comments on the chat box. Thank you so much. Also be aware that the framework that has been touched upon on smart um, cities for South Africa will actually, uh, when we do the circulate the recordings, we'll put a link as well into that so that we can also have it um, when you do look into the edited version of um, this session of today. So on that note, thank you so much to everyone uh, that has contributed to today's session. And as indicated, we just need to find ourselves into this as different stakeholders, uh, different role players within local government. But ultimately, we want to see the change. And I believe that we are those individuals that someday will be counted as well among those who would have done so. That but there has to be something done right now. Let's not be too futuristic. Yes, we want to get there, but as indicated as well, we need to ensure that we get the basics right. Where we are, let's get functional municipalities as best as we can, and then we can start to take forward steps into the smart cities and everything that is much required as well. So on that note, thank you so much once again to everyone and all the participation um, and the inputs from the chat and the questions that were posed 
truly appreciate it. The next week we'll be dealing with personal leadership and also the world of work so that our learners or the students can then be informed of what to expect when they get into the work environment, but also critically ensure that they can lead themselves before they can become leaders within society. So on that note, uh, God bless and keep well, and then we can see each other again next week, same time at 9 a.m. on the Zoom platform. Thank you.